All right, there's a lot to cover today in the latest Linux news for this week. So let's buckle up and get right into it. The Foundry of Builder. Foundry here is a new command line interface based tool for developers that the creator of the GNOME Builder, Christian Hergert, has officially announced development on. The new GNOME Foundry will extract core features from the Builder IDE into a reusable command line interface. It's aimed at making GNOME and GTK app development easier outside of the full builder GUI, offering testing services and, and integrations for developers who prefer terminals over editors. This is pretty cool. As this new tool makes GNOME development a more modular, accessible, and scriptable experience for developers, it lowers the barriers to building GNOME and, and GTK apps. So this is exciting to see coming from the GNOME team. We'll be following this in the future, a brand new tool to Linux when it comes to desktop environments. How cool is that? Hopefully we get to make more applications because of this cool new tool. Now it's going to take quite a while in order to continue building this thing out as there's lots to work on even said by the creator. Some exciting news for Wayback. As the first release has been made, Wayback.1 is a new X11 compatibility layer built on top of Wayland, aiming to let full X11 only desktop environments run atop Wayland without modification. This is a pretty cool compatibility layer. It's going to use X Wayland and WL roots under the hood. It's intended to be a drop-in replacement for the Xorg binary. While it's still an alpha, it's a wonderful tool to see getting new development as this could be a crucial bridge for the transition between X11 and Wayland. Instead of patching legacy apps and maintaining Xorg long-term, Wayland now will allow distros with this compatibility layer to keep using their old X11 environments while benefiting from Wayland's modern features. So they're pleased to announce Wayland's first preview release version 0.1 that was just released. Then they go into what Wayback is, as we've already discussed, and the current status. In the current status, there's no multi-monitor support at the moment. DPMS controlling is not yet supported. Many Xorg options are currently stubs and some other things don't work, e.g. mouse locking. But there's been a lot of progress since the initial announcement and there's going to continue to be a lot more. Exciting for Linux users as this crucial bridge keeps getting built. And the main focus here is actually distributions and their maintenance burden in trying to keep old workflows functional under distributions as we all shift to Wayland. Very cool news and congrats on this release to the Wayback team. Moving on to System D. System D has announced version 258 as it introduces a ton of new updates in its major pre-release that is actually dropping certain legacy support, modernizing core behavior and expanding compatibilities across Linux systems. There's a ton to read through. So I'm just gonna go and summarize this a little bit for you instead of having to read through the whole entire change spec. One thing is that systemd has officially removed support for the C group version one and systemv init scripts, making a clear break from older system management practices. Also the minimum level for systemd requires Linux kernel 5.4 and above. This is clearly a push for distros to modernize their kernel. If they want to use systemd, there have been strict defaults for TTY, devices, TPM handling, and encrypted credentials. We're seeing better containerization and VM support. So this is for things like unprivileged container handling. There's also been tooling and user experience upgrades, including to journal CTL, system CTL, home CTL, and nspawn, which now all seem to have more features and a more improved API. Overall, this release, at least for systemd users, will modernize this Linux system architecture from their end, improve security default and resource isolation, strengthen support for containers, VMs, and security boot flows, and finally drop legacy support on a few things. It is interesting that they are focused on TPM integrated Linux systems with this latest release, clearly shaping the future of how Linux boots runs and manages its services. Now we're getting into a very interesting announcement. But before we do, make sure to subscribe below for more videos like this. You wouldn't want to miss one. YouTube can get finicky. Also, smash that like button on the way back up. Let's talk about a pretty interesting release for FreeBSD 15. The goal here is to extend the FreeBSD installer to offer a minimal KDE-based desktop experience as an install option. The initial concept is a low interaction installation process that upon completion brings the user directly to a KDE graphical screen. How awesome is that? That's an announced for KDE desktop as part of the default installer for free BSD. This is especially nice for newcomers and Linux converts. 
or people transitioning over to FreeBSD. Historically, FreeBSD is a minimalist operating system with bare bones and text-based installers. Setting up a full desktop environment like KDE usually means a ton of manual post installation steps and is an interesting move from FreeBSD breaking its legacy. And this will also improve desktop accessibility. By offering KDE at install time, FreeBSD becomes a more viable option for everyday desktop users. KDE is a great desktop environment that I highly tout myself and use across Arch Linux and other distributions. And it is definitely an interesting signal, at least from what I think, FreeBSD trying to meet its users halfway. It's not just trying to cater to power users anymore and server administrators. It looks like this is a step towards broader adoption. Hopefully it will attract desktop users and developers with a lower barrier of entry competing against Linux on the desktop with this wonderful desktop environment, KDE. Speaking on KDE, this week in Plasma, rounded bottom corners is the focus. Interestingly enough, the most notable new feature for Plasma 6.5, Breeze decorated windows now have their bottom corners rounded by KWIN automatically. This feature is on by default, but can be turned off if you preferred the older style. So subtle, but such a big change as you can see the bottom corners rounded now. You can of course turn this off as it is the default now for KD 6.5. Some users are going to throw a fit over this. There's a lot of people who don't like rounded corners. A lot of UI has gone down that road and KD honestly is just catching up. It's wild that that's the most notable thing that's come out of KD this week with 6.5, but this is one of the most requested changes for aesthetic consistency by users. It gives them a more polished and cohesive windowing experience. But some other notable improvements include updates to resizable sidebars, smarter K runner search results, and bug fixes for improved accessibility, HDR support, and app stability. KDE is a top tier desktop environment for Linux and others. So I love seeing how they continue to develop things and polish up the user experience and user interface. Now I wanna move on to graphics cards. As we're seeing updates to drivers and more information available from both AMD and NVIDIA this week. First off, a patch by AMD called the Analog Connector Support in DC. This new patch series by Timur adds Analog Connector, aka VGA and DVI support to AMD's DC display stack for older GPUs. It restores the functionality loss when AMD moved from its legacy display code to DC or, or display core, don't think direct current, architecture particularly on the Tonga and Hawaii GPUs and unblocks enabling AMD GPU for GFX cards by default. This is important to users as it restores analog output support for many older AMD GPUs and helps legacy hardware users use CRTs and VGA only projectors or older monitors as they will benefit from this restored functionality. It's great to see that they're still focused on legacy systems as this kind of came out of the blue. And on the other hand, NVIDIA has been open sourcing some documentation for GPUs, including the Hopper and Blackwell DMA copy class header files. This here is a release. This here is a release of another batch of MIT licensed header files for its Blackwell and Hopper GPUs, adding more than a thousand lines focused on DMA copy classes. These follow a larger 12,000 line dump last week that has already been integrated in a Mesa and benefiting the Nuvo drivers and the experimental Nova Rust driver for NVIDIA cards. This helps us reverse engineer these now open headers, which give developers the necessary technical information to build a fully open source driver without needing to guess GPU internals. It speeds up Mesa driver support, especially for the Blackwell GPUs, which will help advance the drivers faster. This is another small but meaningful step towards open NVIDIA GPU support on Linux, something that the Linux community has wanted for quite a while. An interesting dump for us. Hopefully these keep coming as we also see an interesting announcement. But before we get to this, if you're ready to level up your Linux experience, check out my checklist, cheat sheet, my map, and new flashcards, all at SavvyNick.com today. And now this announcement is very interesting. NVIDIA is, is bringing CUDA to risk, marking the first official support of its GPU compute platform on open CPU architecture. The announcement was made at the Risk v Summit in China and reflects the growing Risk v traction in data center and AI workloads. As RISC-V International has posted exciting news from RISC-V Summit China as Franz Seistermans from NVIDIA announces CUDA is coming to RISC-V. The port will enable a RISC-V 
CPU to the main application processor in CUDA-based AI systems. This is a milestone for RISC-V, signaling a maturing open hardware stack compatible of handling high-end GPU workloads. A very interesting announcement. Nonetheless, let's talk about ButterFS, or BtreeFS, the file system. As we see a continued update into a very interesting performance improvement, that's going to be settled in for hopefully Linux 6.17. This new patch here will bring in performance improvements with a new currently experimental large folio support or LFS, which will help the file system with things like 20% faster file creation, better read performance on compressed data and fewer meta allocations via X-Array indexing. This large folio support is going to really help with memory efficiency. As ButterFS continues to develop a powerful Linux file system with snapshotting, checksums, and compression, we're getting closer and closer to matching performance with EXT4 and XFS file systems as well. Very cool to see these updates coming to 6.17. As long as things go well, I've already discussed this in way more depth about how large folio support actually helps file systems in a different video. I'm gonna post it in the description below. So check that out if you're interested in how we're going to see performance improvements from these updates. Moving right along, did you know about 8% of source packages on SID build at least one Rust library in its binary package, almost double compared to Bookworm, the stable version of Debian? That's pretty wild. SID is the unstable development branch for the Debian Linux distribution. It's where all the new packages and updates first land before migrating and testing and eventually becoming stable and part of the stable release cycle. It's rolling release and it's wild to see over 3,000 source packages shipping with, with Rust source code in LibRust dev, 150 source packages shipping with compiled Rust binaries and libraries, as it is a big deal for Linux users. It shows a ecosystem shift towards Rust. Rust is being adopted all over the place, replacing C and C++ in parts of the Linux ecosystem due to its memory safety and modern tooling. Rust is entering all sorts of critical system software, including systemd, GNOME, and even the Linux kernel. This adoption, even in Debian SID, shows that Rust has matured from a niche language into part of Linux software development. We'll see how things continue on, but I thought this was an interesting announcement. Speaking about announcements for Debian, Trixie release planning. Yes, we finally are getting some information on when Trixie, the next stable Debian release. We are planning to release Trixie on August 9th. There will be release parties. See if you wanna join or organize one. The full freeze will start on July 27th, very soon here in a few days. Once the full freeze is instated, every package will need an unblock to be able to migrate to testing. Please see freeze policy for the qualifications on migration where we are aware that this notice is shorter than we wanted, but we don't want to delay the release. This is exciting news for Debian users as we finally see a new stable release coming up. Very cool. We'll see it in the next few weeks. I'll be checking it out, so don't forget to follow along. And now let's get into some oddities. As Chromium has adopted the Wayland Support Color Management Protocol, this will add support for the Color Management Version 1, enabling rendering of HDR surfaces in the Chromium browser. So this is coming out after probably a couple of months of being available. Chromium has finally ported in that management protocol from Wayland in order to give us support for HDR on the most popular browser. It's cool to see this and it'll be interesting to test. We're also seeing a breaking up of Intel. Intel has lost quite a few engineers at this point with layoffs. I go into much more depth about all this, including a massive announcement for a particular Linux distribution in a previous video that I'm going to link in the description below. But not only are they losing engineers like Jithu Joseph here, who will soon be leaving Intel, we've seen many announcements from others as they're moving on from Intel. But this is also creating orphaned projects, including the slim bootloader SBL firmware that according to this engineer, to the best of my knowledge, there is no one familiar enough with SBL who can take over his role. And with the restructuring and Intel happening, we're seeing a lot of effect on Linux with certain drivers being orphaned, development being stopped, and even distributions coming to a halt. That's right, all good things come to an end, shutting down clear Linux OS. This was announced almost a week ago at this point, and I have a video that goes into depth on what all transpired here, but announcement from the clear Linux OS team, Arjun here made a post that says, after many years of support, clear Linux OS effective immediately, Intel will no longer provide security updates, patches, and maintenance for the operating system, which was a blow 
to a lot of its users. They could have at least tried to wean people off the distribution, but they ended things abruptly here. We'll see how this transpires over the long term and what actually is going to happen with Intel in Linux. Regardless, they're not doing well. Finally, in the last bit of interesting news from Linux, Arch Linux had a security breach with particular binaries and source packages having contained malware in the Arch user repositories. On the 16th of July, around 8 p.m., a malicious AUR package was uploaded to the AUR. Two other malicious packages were uploaded by the same user a few hours later. These packages were installing a script coming from the same GitHub repo that was identified as a remote access Trojan. These are the three affected LibreWolf fix bin, Firefox patch bin, and Zen browser patched bin. This was very interesting as these three malicious AUR packages were uploaded and put users of the AUR at risk. I'd call this a bit of a wake up call for Linux users and maintainers to audit and use sandboxing practices in order to use packages that blindly trust random users as contribution to the AUR can be made by anyone. And a lot of users have to use it in order to get proprietary or the latest and greatest packages. While this doesn't happen often, it is something that we need to make sure we stay on top of. I talk about many ways to protect yourself when using these types of packages from users in my other video. Again, a link in the description below to check that out as there's a lot to cover there and I can't get into it in this particular video. But I am super excited that you made it to the end of the video. You're a true fan. Don't forget to subscribe below and smash that like button on the way back up so other people get this news. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching.